So it's really my pleasure to um, be given a chance to give the uh, Jacob Monty seminar where I used to be the audience and was greatly inspired by the other talks. Uh, so, so the topic today is, um, um, uh, is about some uh, deep connection between uh, several seemingly disconnected uh, concepts like a, a topological concept called a modular transformation, which I will explain later. And then a geometric concept, which is the symmetry of a surface and also a topological phase. Then there's a, a, a transversal gate uh, of a quantum error correction code. Uh, uh, so the, the work was done in collaboration with Mason and Mohammed, and it's posted on archive. Uh, so let's begin with uh, experiments. So uh, to some people, uh, some people believe it's already the age of quantum computation, at least um, by the industrial people. So there are uh, lots of efforts um, on building superconducting qubits and our local business of uh, iron traps and also Marana qubits. And there are uh, many others which I cannot exhaust here. Uh, I mentioned this because um, our theory can potentially be applied to all of them. Um, so the major challenge towards the ultimate goal of quantum computing is uh, uh, really the decoherence due to the environment which is always uh, watching uh, and the quantum systems and uh, uh, decohere uh, your quantum information. Uh, so however, there is a clever way uh, to avoid that is to um, uh, encode your uh, quantum information uh, non-locally, and I really like the uh, metaphor by John Preskill that uh, uh, you have make a quantum book. So what this quantum book means, uh, so locally there's no information there. So you cannot read anything. So, but uh, you encode the, the quantum information in a collective way uh, to the highly entangled many body states of these qubits, such as the topological state. So in this way, so the environment tries to read the quantum book, but uh, actually um, cannot get any information. Uh, so hence it cannot decohere the state. Uh, so uh, for the interest of this talk, we are uh, interested in uh, topological states, uh, which uh, um, uh, the topological degeneracy will arise uh, when you um, put the systems uh, uh, man, non-trivial man, manifold, either with a genus or some boundary, so, so it opens up the degeneracy. Uh, and in s some cases, uh, the non-local information is stored in some uh, so-called Wilson line operator. Um, and then in the more familiar case, like surface code, it's nothing but a poly string operator of X or Z um, operators, uh, like the, in the, this picture. And all, it can be a Wilson loop operator around the torus. Uh, so in all these cases, uh, any local operator uh, which applied by the environment can uh, not leave the topological degeneracy, hence reduce your T1 and T2 time. And not point the laser in the audience. Oh, OK. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. This, this angle is a bit, um, yeah. So the key thing is take your finger off the switch when it's not going. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, yeah, this uh, I, I was kind of uncomfortable with the yeah angles. We understand your theories. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So so there's no um, the local interaction cannot uh, couple um, uh, the uh, states in the uh, in uh, in your. Um, uh, topological subspace and uh, hence cause logical error because the logical error can only cause by a non-local operator such as this uh, Wilson line operator. Uh, so, so now we have a quantum memory, to topological quantum memory. The next question is uh, how to manipulate the quantum information which is uh, stored in a very complicated way, uh, uh, stored kind non-locally. So it turns out there, uh, uh, there's a unified geometric uh, picture um, for all, all these cases. So now, now I have a table here. So I have uh, three kind of entries here. One is topology. Uh, so it uh, associates to um, a surface of manifold sigma. So, so in, in, then there, there is a topological phase or in a topological error correction code, which are both uh, defined by a topological quantum field theory. So, so in the quantum field theory perspective, 
it associates uh, the surface of this manifold uh, to a Hilbert space, uh, which stores your quantum information. And in one case, it's the ground state subspace, and the other case is the cold space. So, so these um, two cases are uh, uh, pursued by uh, different companies, like Microsoft is the so-called passive uh, topological quantum computation, and then uh, the other companies uh, are pursuing the active uh, error correction. Uh, so, but they are essentially all very similar. Uh, so the way to perform a logical operation is actually very simple. It's just uh, by deforming uh, the surface. And uh, uh, more formally, uh, you can introduce the mathematic con concept called diffeomorphism, which is a smooth map between uh, one surface to the other, visualized here as uh, producing the metric locally as one case. So you can make it more interesting or non-trivial by introducing some punctures uh, in the space, uh, such that topological degeneracy ar arises. Uh, so th then to apply logical operation, you have some a constraint that uh, uh, you have uh, introduced a self diffeomorphism that maps the surface back to itself, so such that you don't change the, uh, you apply a unitary operation uh, on the same Hilbert space, so map the Hilbert space back to itself. So that is exactly a protect logical gate. So as a very uh, familiar example for uh, uh, most of the people that one case is this braid or half twist of these two punctures, which are exactly map the surface back to itself. So uh, to show, uh, to keep track of what's happening, you can just this reference line before and after the operation. So now we know how to do the logical operation uh, of a topological uh, quantum computer. So, so now uh, let me introduce uh, uh, the central concept in this talk, which is called a, a, a mapping class group of a surface it, it's a group which con, uh, consisting of all the, this deformation, this self diffeomorphism modular, some uh, uh, trivial um, deformation connect to the identity map, which is like a local deformation. So, um, and the elements of this mapping class group are called modular transformation. So, so let's still consider the special case which everybody understand, uh, which is the mapping class group on a disk uh, with M punctures. So, so for topologists, this is a disk, uh, and uh, there are punctures there, and you can do braiding of these um, punctures, and uh, it's exactly equivalent to the braid group of uh, N strands. So then we have this picture, which familiar to people that uh, usually you can perform a non uh, uh, um, adiabatic braiding of a non abelian anions in, in one case. And the other case is that you can also break boundary defects in surface codes, and they are similar to some extent. Uh, so in both cases, their concept, which is the code distance, is determined by the separation uh, between the anions or the punctures. Uh, so, so the property of this kind of operation is a single logical gate always takes the time of order d, the code distance time. So, it's, um, so, so while your memory becomes ro more robust, because the code distance increase, then you are slower uh, in information processing. So, so in this talk, we want to consider to generalize to the case where uh, we consider mapping class group of a, a surface, uh, not only with punctures, but also a genus. Uh, so where the topological degeneracy can arise is because of, also of this genus. Uh, so let's consider uh, the simplest case of a torus. So in this torus, I have two non contraptor cycles. And in physics, we can define an operator, so-called this Wilson loop operators appear before. So it describes a physical processes of creating a pair of anions and anti-anions, and then move the other around one cycle and annihilate. That's what this operator uh, describes. Uh, so, so, so with this operator, uh, we can label uh, the ground space or the um, cold space uh, by uh, the anion charge and uh, define the so-called topological sectors. So they are kind of the logical qubits, uh, stores the quantum information, and uh, we have these two cycles. One is called alpha and the other is beta. And we can uh, label uh, the state with uh, this anion charge uh, by choosing one um, basis and uh, 
inserting the Wilson loop uh, into the vacuum. So you can also choose the dual cycle. So in the case with which people are more familiar, like Toricode, they this uh, nothing but the um, poly string operators X or Z, which don't commute with <laughs> each other. And the QDIT, four level QDITs are the four uh, topological sectors, which are vacuum and the E and M and the, the combination of them. So, uh, so and the topological subspace, subspace forms a representation of the mapping class group, which means uh, the uh, mapping class group, uh, the module transformation can um, become the unitary transformation of this subspace. Uh, so there are two generators of the torus, uh, the mapping class group of torus. One is so-called this S transformation, which essentially uh, exchange these two loops and then reversing the uh, direction of one of the loop. So it m maps alpha beta to minus beta alpha. And then remember, it's also a unitary transformation. So in the Heisenberg picture, it uh, transformed the Wilson loop operator uh, to the other one. So, so that's one uh, generator. And the other generator is so-called the dent twist. So it uh, twists uh, this red loop to go also around the torus with the other cycle, around the other cycle. So that can be understood by a surgery approach that you cut the torus along this handle and twist the tube by two pi and then glue it together. So it's a kind of a very crazy transformation. It's hard to imagine how to realize in the physical system, but we will do that. Uh, so, so, so what this does is it maps the Wilson loop beta to the alpha plus beta, the twisted loop. So then also let me introduce some other operation called reflections, which change the orientation of one of the loop, is alpha and beta. And this uh, um, orientation reversing map, which is in contrast to all the pre previous one, which uh, orientation preserving. Uh, so now you may ask what's the power of the uh, mapping class, the representation of the mapping class group. One of them is actually this S and T matrix on the torus includes the fractional uh, statistics of anions. So the S matrix, which uh, can be shown by this kind of Feynman diagram picture, and uh, it corresponds to a, a more abstract uh, space-time surgery uh, procedure proposed by Wheaton. And uh, it essentially describes a, a space-time history where uh, one anion goes around uh, the other. So, so, that, so in this case, it encodes the um, rating statistics of anions. So if, if A and B equal to each other, it's the self rating statistics. If it's different, then it encodes the mutual rating statistics. And th then this T matrix uh, encodes the uh, topological spin, which corresponds to the twist of the anions lines. So the, the other power of the representation of mapping class group it, kind of enhancing quantum computation power of topological state makes a non-universal state with, with only braiding to universal uh, gate sets. And also for non abelian anions, um, which has trivial braiding statistics, uh, trivial braiding operation makes it, there's non-trivial uh, mapping class group operation. Uh, so, so, so then there's another type of uh, logical operation. So, so previously, all this, and picture is kind of some surface deformation, that's logical operation. And then the, in the world of quantum error correction code, there's another type which is called transversal gate. Uh, and let me first introduce the definition of protected gate. It is a constant depth circuit with only local interaction like this. So it's protected because the, there's a Lieber Robinson bound, uh, bounds the error uh, such that uh, uh, the anion string lens is much smaller than the code distance, so, so it cannot corrupt your quantum memory. Uh, so a more general definition is so-called local unitary. It can be also applied to continuum case. So a more restrictive, uh, restricted class is so-called transversal logical gate. So it defined, it's defined as a logical operation, which is a product of a local unitary. Uh, so it then coupled to uh, sites in the same code block. 
So mo the, the most familiar case is the so-called, uh, in the CSS code, you have a transversal C0, logical C0 is a product of a local C0 between uh, these two code blocks. Uh, so, so uh, but uh, uh, keep in mind, in general, this U doesn't have to be the same type as V as, as in the case here. Uh, so, but, uh, but the transversal case is only mainly discussing the abelian topological code, and such as um, color code, you, uh, implement Clifford gate set up to now. Uh, and the, the question is, is there a geometrical topological picture similar to the manifold deformation picture I just talked um, previously? So, so we will give an answer to this question. Uh, so let me discuss a preliminary scheme uh, to realize one of the uh, modular S transformation. So imagine you have a square and with a long range periodic boundary condition, which is equivalent to a torus. So this S transformation is nothing but a pi over two rotation of the whole thing, which uh, exchange these two uh, loops and flip the uh, direction of one of them. So that's S. But then, then you can decompose this rotation by two reflections, or one diagonal one, so which um, kind of already exchange uh, exchange these two loops, uh, and the other one flip the uh, direction of one of them. So, so this one is a, a, a single reflection is just a, an S with an extra R, um, an extra reflection. So it's R-S transformation. So we can get both of them uh, with this rotation. So, but now there's a problem is this transformation is kind of non-local. You need a, either reflection or rotation. So, but we can fix this problem by simply by fold, doing an origami that um, fold this system. So in this case, uh, a reflection, uh, a diagonal reflection becomes nothing uh, but a, a transversal swap operation between two layers, which are uh, um, defined uh, like this. It's a, it's a product of pairwise swaps between these two um, layers. So in this case, we can perform uh, one of the previous transformation, uh, exchange these two cycles just by transversal operation. Uh, but there is a problem, still a problem is that uh, to make this torus, we need a long range boundary condition. And also we don't know how to uh, make a, a, a dentist, and we don't know how to generalize to hygiene surface. So to do that, we introduce uh, an extra ingredient called uh, genomes or twist defects so let me first uh, uh, talk about what is a twist effect. So we consider two decoupled layer of topological states, such as the uh, quantum Hall uh, system, a bilayer graphing. So you have, this system has a Z2 layer exchange symmetry. And one can introduce some branch cut, which twist this uh, Z2 symmetry. So uh, like this picture, basically build a staircase between these two floors. So if any goes uh, uh, across branch cut, they will go to the other layers, uh, vice versa. Uh, so, so this cre creates a, a multi-sheeted Riemann surface. Uh, it's, mo it's interesting that uh, this multi-sheeted Riemann surface can actually be equivalent to a hygiene surface if you just flip uh, uh, one of these layers, so shown in this picture. Uh, so actually, it bri bridges the two concepts, which is symmetry, layer exchange symmetry, and the topology, hygiene surface. So a general uh, conclusion is that uh, uh, if you have a sphere, actually two uh, layers of sphere with two uh, n pairs of uh, these twist defects, the defects is the boundary of the branch cuts, then you can create a high genus service with m minus uh, one uh, genus. Uh, so in the simple exa example, we can uh, create a, a torus just with a bilayer system with a two a pair of branch cuts. So you, you can see the equivalence by, uh, uh, through the first homology, which are these non contractable loops in both cases. So they have one-to-one -one correspondence. So these loops, which goes around these two defects, can map, be mapped to this loop. And the other loop goes travel to both layers across the branch cuts twice, can be mapped to this, uh, the beta cycle in the torus. So an S transformation is nothing but exchange these uh, two si uh, loops with a flipped one of the uh, direction. 
And the more interesting case is the dentists in this torus picture is actually mapped to uh, transforming this horizontal loop to a diagonal loop. So there's an interesting symmetry uh, in this system when you introduce these twist effects. Uh, so so the, now we can actually implement the transformations uh, in this system. Uh, so the first, uh, the first step is that we can perform a diagonal uh, reflection, a mirror reflection of the system, so which is uh, correspond to long-range pairwise sw swaps across the system. So it needs long-range pairwise swap. So then you see that, uh, so these blue loops come here and the red loop comes down here. So they kind of exchange their position. But there's a problem. So the Hilbert space becomes different because the twist defects, the manifold becomes different. So the twist line comes to here. But you can fix uh, this problem by introduce a transversal swap in the central square region here. So, so now you change the connection. So, so this one, which, which was connected, become disconnected. It goes to the other layer. So, so the one which has a twist now is connected. So what you did is basically cut this red piece and the glue uh, to, to the upper layer. So you come back to exactly the, the previous configuration, and then you exchange these red and blue loops. So that's a, exactly an S transformation up to a reflection. And you can fix this reflection by applying another reflection of this blue loop. So actually, we can do the S transformation. Three minutes. Oh. So OK, so, so this is a, um, but the problem is this is need long range uh, interaction, which uh, is kind of an opportunity for I and Q. But, uh, but we want also make it uh, locally. So uh, now we come to the orogamy again. We can actually fold this bilayer system into the four layer systems. So in this case, all the previous um, uh, operations uh, uh, can be done by just transversal swap, uh, which in conclusion is uh, you just swap uh, the layer one, four, three, and two in the central triangular region, and uh, in the rest of the region you uh, you swap layer one, two, and three, four. <coughs> so that's a protect logical gate with constant depth circuit, and it satisfies the definition of a transversal logical gate. So we can also do uh, the dentist. Uh, by switch to a slightly different geometry, which you uh, you, you put this um, uh, genomes, the twist defects on a triangles. Then you see there's a nice symmetry now that uh, this beta loop is uh, symmetric to this um, twisted alpha plus beta loop. So a dentist in this case is simply a mirror reflection, which you, you can exchange this green and the uh, red loop. So you can also do it transversely by fold this to four layers. So, and then apply swap just between layer one and two and three and four. So, 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 so the central result of this work is that we get a zoo of uh, transversal logical gates and uh, uh, determined by the underlying topological quantum field theory. And, and uh, the, the, exci uh, the more exciting result is for non-abelian phases uh, such as icing phases or non-billion codes, you, you can get some non clifford gate, which is so-called T-gate, to make the computation universal. And for the Fibonacci, you can have a universal set of uh, uh, logical gates. And the nice result is that we actually circumvent the no-code theorem proven by a John Preskill's group uh, that there is no non-trivial uh, transversal gate in non-billion phases. But we can get a zoo of them. Uh, so the essence of that is um, uh, essentially the essence of the no-go theorem uh, by John Preskill's group is from local unitary. If you have a spatially homogeneous system, you can never uh, map this loop to a, a dual loop through just a constant depth local unitary. That's obviously the case. But in our picture, because of the folding and the intro introducing the branch cuts uh, and uh, uh, this... Um, Gap boundaries. So we actually make this. Um, so if, if you view from the top, this red and blue loop are essentially at the same place. So we can just do the layer, the layer swaps. So such that make the 
red loop uh, uh, exchange with the uh, blue loop. And they don't commute with each other. So in the simplest case, like fractional quantum Hall state, it is a hard market because of this non-commuting algebra. And, uh, and the picture uh, to illustrate uh, our, our, the essence of our, our idea is you create a, a manifold with many branch cuts, which are visualized by this staircase. And by um, doing swaps between different uh, floors in your building, so you can make a topological quantum computation. So, 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 so to compare with the traditional scheme of doing adiabatic braiding, it has the disadvantage of being slow, which is inversion, inverse proportion to the gap size and a linear overhead with the co-distance. D, because you have to make the ending goes around the other one. But we have this uh, so-called orgmi quantum computation. And it, what you do is you fold the manifold and uh, you, uh, you have some cut that you get these branch cuts and you glue some of the edge, create gap boundary, and finally you just need to do swaps. So the, the advantage is it's really just a, a single shot with constant depths. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, so th there, there's some caution that uh, transversal gate itself cannot be universal due to Eastern Kinnear theorem. So there's another no-go theorem. But, uh, but uh, we, we actually know, uh, it's not in the current paper, but we actually know some constant depth circuit which is not transversal gate, but they can uh, switch the geometry between the square and the triangle such that uh, uh, in, uh, finally, we have a constant depth circuit. Uh, so then there are some experimental realization. Let me, due to the limitation of time, I skip one of them. Here I just build some air bridge and I have a single uh, layer of a sublet structure to implement multi-layer system. So uh, more realistic way is uh, to have a quantum error correction code, which also you have a sublet structure that, uh, uh, so each plaquette vertex has uh, uh, more than one colors of stabilizer, and then you measure um, um, both of them. Either like two layers, you have two types of stabilizer, four layers, you have four types of stabilizers. So you can make them with uh, any qubit systems. Uh, so finally, we can also measure uh, the modular matrix. It turns out that that's figured out by Max Greiner, the experiment how to measure swap operator. It turns out it's, it's, it's just a, uh, if you apply beam splitter operation by just replace all the swap option here by half of the tunneling time and with some extra phase factor, uh, you can just measure uh, the uh, parity operators, uh, the product of parity operator in each layer. You basically do an image. So then you can uh, actually extract, a, uh, you do a sampling experiment and you can ext extract a, a parity membrane operator which encodes uh, the braiding statistics. So, okay, that, so that's my summary. So we have uh, two uh, major achievements. One is make a, a transversal logical gate, especially uh, for non-abelian phases, which uh, there was a no-go theorem. It didn't exist, now it, uh, there's a zoo of them. So the other is we know how to measure a topological order in a synthetic quantum system, which is interest by JQI, so especially in AMO setups, which is already done by Max Greiner to measure entangled entropy. You basically can have the same kind of setup if you have a topological phase, then you can also measure the braiding statistics. Sorry, I'm over time. Okay, so thank you, Ian, for introducing me. Uh, today I'm going to be... So I uh, recently defended my PhD here, and I'm a new postdoc. And so if you know me, um, wow, it does just stay on a little bit. <laughs> just, so if you've talked to me recently, um, this title might confuse you a little bit because I've been working on Bose-Einstein condensation. But I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about some earlier work that I did during my degree with my advisor, Victor Golitsky, um, and our collaborators. And this is more of a condensed matter type of flavor. So I'll be talking to you about transport signatures of Dirac electrons in a random magnetic field. And I'll introduce sort of why we why we care about this idea. Um, so firstly, I uh, just want to do a quick introduction to the idea of disordered systems in condensed matter physics. So we have a lot of um, cold atoms people here, but in condensed matter, there's always dirt in your system, um, and there's always disorder. And so it's always been um, an interesting question and a question that theorists and experimentalists try to investigate. Uh, is this interplay of disorder and interactions in condensed matter systems. So the basic idea is you have a Hamiltonian uh, with some potential, and this potential fluctuates depending on where you are in space. 
So usually we consider um, potentials that sort of average out to zero, um, but then they may have some non-zero uh, two-point correlation function. So there's many paths that an electron can take going through this minefield of impurities. Um, and um, this scattering due to these random potential can affect electron transport in a major way. So one uh, interesting thing that comes about because of this is called weak localization. So if you have so-called self-intersecting paths, you have sort of destructive interference of your electron wave function and you get an increase in resistivity. This is known as weak localization. Um, and then there's also the well-known phenomenon of Anderson localization. So if you have very strong disorder, it's well known that conventional electronic systems will just localize in the presence of strong enough disorder. Um, so this is with a so-called scalar potential, but we can also consider a random vector potential. Um, and this is a proposed model for a lot of different types of systems with phase fluctuations. And a random vector potential, um, you can think of it leads to a random magnetic field. You can also think of it as a type of disorder that locally breaks time reversal symmetry in the system, but on average, time reversal symmetry may not be broken. And so particularly an example of this is actually strain in graphene. So in graphene, there are two Dirac cones, and um, there's some degeneracy between them. But if you have strain in your system, then time reversal symmetry is broken locally, and it actually acts very similar to a random magnetic field um, and can cause uh, interesting transport effects. Um, and it's also been proposed as a model for spin liquids. So the idea of a random magnetic field um, has been around for a long time and trying to understand how electronic systems behave in the presence of vector potential disorder versus simply scalar disorder um, is a question that, that is asked frequently. In particular, um, Dirac fermions uh, and vector disorder is a model that has been around for a very long time. So um, one of the first models, I believe, of Dirac fermions interacting with vector disorder was actually for the quantum Hall effect. Um, and the idea is that there's lots of theories about systems that obey this type of physics, but very few experimental systems where this type of physics is known to occur. So ripples in graphene is one, but it's pretty hard to control the ripples in graphene. So the idea was that we wanted to understand if we could observe this type of physics using uh, known Dirac materials, um, i.e. topological insulators, which are sort of the first thing that I think about when I think about Dirac materials. And why would we want to use Dirac materials as opposed to just more conventional electron systems? And it's because they have this fairly simple Hamiltonian. Um, so this Hamiltonian applies to the surface of a three-dimensional topological insulator. So it's a 2D Hamiltonian. Um, and it looks simple on the face, but it has very interesting features. So the spin um, is directly coupled to the real momentum and spin of the particle. Um, and then so this is referred to as spin momentum locking. And so if you couple to a magnetic system or magnetic impurity, there's this simple um, exchange coupling between the magnet and the spin of the particle that then directly affects the momentum properties. So any type of magnetization um, or magnetic impurities can directly affect the electronic properties of the system in a pretty straightforward way. And this is just a picture of the free electronic spectrum of the surface state. It's this Dirac cone. It's a linear spectrum, and then there's some um, spin texture due to the spin momentum locking. So the way I've written it here, the spin is, um, you can't really see it here, but the spin is just transverse to the momentum at any point on the Fermi surface. So one other important point is that the conducting surface states in a 3D TI are immune to this Anderson localization, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so if there's any type of disorder in your system that doesn't break time reversal symmetry, this Dirac cone is preserved. So this is um, really convenient, and people have been thinking about using TIs for efficient devices, but this idea that there's going to be no, not, no magnetic disorder also is sort of difficult. So um, if you have disorder that breaks time reversal symmetry, or if you just have a uniform magnetic field, um, you will lose this linear linear character. And so the system that I'm going to be talking about today is a chunk of topological insulator and then with a magnetic material on the top of it. 
Um, so you can think of sort of patterning a TI with magnets of various types and um, getting interesting phenomena out. So first I want to talk a little bit more about what work has already been done in this area of coupling 3D topological insulators with types of magnetization. So there's two scenarios I've outlined here. First is the out-of-plane magnet magnetization scenario. So this is either a uniform magnetic field or a ferromagnet, something where all the magnetic moments are pointing uh, in one direction out of plane. And so this is the Hamiltonian that would govern that in that case. Um, and so here now we have a diagonal element. So if we go to diagonalize this two by two matrix, then we find that there's actually a gap in the spectrum. And we have a, what's typically called a massive Dirac cone. So it has a quadratic energy spectrum. Um, but so we've gapped out the spectrum here, so you can in have an insulating state depending on where your chemical potential is. But we haven't lost all interesting phenomena. So we still have this spin texture here um, and the spin momentum locking, which can lead to quantum Hall effect. Um, or if you have a spatially uh, magnetization that changes in space, you can imagine a domain wall where you have the magnetization switching. There's some point at which this will vanish. And so on that line of the domain wall, you can still have a conducting surface state. So there's a lot of interesting work on sort of patterning conducting states on, on top of TIs using magnets. But in our case, we're interested in the in-plane magnetic field, which maintains this linear spectrum. So here, um, I've simply rewritten the exchange coupling to the magnet as an effective gauge field. Now this, in my case, I'm not going to... Um, consider a time-dependent field, so it's not true gauge field in that sense, but it couples in the same way that a gauge field couples um, through this momentum here. And so you can see if this, if this is just constant, so there's no spatial dependence, it's just going to shift the location of the Dirac point, and you can just do a gauge transformation and get rid of this factor. But if it's not constant, say it has some spatial dependence, um, we just wanted to understand what might happen in this case. Um, just sort of as an aside, there's been many experiments done, probably more um, since I completed this work on actually coupling surface states to magnetic impurities. And they were able to measure this opening of the gap on the surface of the TI. So you can see going from the sort of linear spectrum to this massive Dirac cone here. And in this case, they measured a coupling of about 50 MeV. Um, the experiments with a full slice of material on top of the TI um, haven't measured the gap directly, uh, but they are able to see sort of changes in, in the TI um, due to this coupling. So we know that this exists and this exchange um, is a real phenomenon. So back to our focus, here's, um, so really what we need is, we, we know the properties of the 3D topological insulator that we wanna study. We need to find a magnet that fits um, with the description of this effective gauge field. So it needs to be an easy plane magnet, just meaning that all of the moments are in plane, and we want to minimize the amount of out of plane magnetic moment that we have. Um, and so in that way, we're going to be able to simulate a random vector potential using the actual magnet. And so this is um, just some examples of materials that are known to have very strong in plane anisotropy, so that all of the magnetic moments are in the plane. Um, and this is just meant to show this is going to be a transport experiment. So we're looking at the Dirac electrons kind of flowing through this um, field. So I'm going to introduce the type of magnet that we want, uh, want to study. So the 2D magnetic XY model is the perfect model for our magnet. Um, it has no net magnetization at finite temperature. Um, so the expectation value of magnetization is... Uh, zero, and our magnetic order parameter is just a spin in the plane, so it has a single degree of freedom. Um, and it's described by a very simple Hamiltonian, but you'll notice that the order parameter itself has some degeneracy, so if you translate by 2 pi, the spin will be pointing in the same direction. And because of that, um, this model has vortices in it, so it's sort of hard to see, but you can have vortices in the magnet where as you translate around a closed path, the spin is also rotating. And so this leads to a lot of interesting phenomena, actually. So um, this, this model goes through a classical phase transition. So at low temperatures, you have bound pairs of vortices. And I'll show on the next slide, you have algebraic order in your spin correlations. And that's going to be important for the characteristics of the random magnetic field that we're going to look at later. And then above some temperature, which I've called TBKT, the vortices um, 
become unpaired and you have what looks just like a disordered system. So one other way to think about this is that there is an energy cost to create a vortex because this gradient term is going to be non-zero, but it also increases the entropy. So if you look at the free energy, it's just energy minus entropy. At some point, it's going to be actually more useful to create a lot of vortices. So that's what happens at high temperature. Um, and this model, um, and then at actual zero temperature, you have long range order. So this model um, was studied by Brzezinski and then separately by Kostelitz and Thales. And this phase transition um, was what won them part of the Nobel Prize in 2016. Um, Brzezinski uh, passed away in 1980, so he was not eligible, unfortunately. But um, this is one example of a topological phase transition, which now topological phase transition sort of means something different. But the idea is just that there's these topological defects that are driving the transition. This is classical, not a quantum effect. Um, and then the spin-spin correlation functions look like this. So below this BKT transition temperature, um, you have algebraic, which is usually called quasi-long range order. And then above it, you just have exponentially decaying order. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to the, the critical exponent here because it's dependent on the temperature. So this is an interesting experimental knob that we have to actually change um, the character of this exponent. And you can see that it decays very slowly. So when t equals uh, the transition temperature, this is still only a, a fourth. Um, so this is the magnet that we're going to couple the Ti to. So I can go back to the Hamiltonian that we had before with this gauge field here. So from just our undergrad ENM, we know that uh, a gauge potential is really useful because it describes some physical effect. So it describes an electric field or a magnetic field or something to that effect. So in our case, um, the magnetic field would come from time-dependent fluctuations. But here, we're going to assume the magnet is classical, which just means that the fluctuations of the magnet are significantly slower than fluctuations of the Dirac fermions. So we don't have to worry about any emergent electric field. The magnetic field is going to come from the curl of this gauge potential, um, which, because of the way it's related to the magnetization, is just directly related to the longitudinal magnetic fluctuations. And in particular, the magnetic field uh, is created by sort of spin waves in the magnet and then also these vortices. And the effective magnetic field due to the vortices is very non-local. So if you're at, at any point R in the system, then the magnetic field due to the vortices depends on the position of every single vortex in the system, and then also some phase factor having to do with the vortices. So this is, um, in the paper we talk a little bit more about it, but this is how the ma random magnetic field comes about. Because any situation that you have, any magnet, you're going to have a different configuration of vortices every time you run the experiment. And, and the thing that's going to be relevant for transport is actually this longitudinal spin-spin correlation function. So again, the, the great thing about Dirac fermions and studying this type of system is that it's very easy to map from the actual magnetic moment to the gauge field. Um, and this correlation function is directly related to the um, correlations of the magnetic field. So this is a gauge invariant quantity. So now, finally, I can get to the actual calculation that we did. So this is a perturbative calculation. So we consider a chemical potential much larger than our coupling to the magnet. Um, and then we have two experimental knobs here. So the temperature tunes the range of disorder, um, as I talked about with the properties of XY model. And then the doping tunes the disorder strength, so how much it's going to affect it. So you can change the chemical potential. And then um, we just go through Druda theory. This is the transport quasi-particle lifetime, um, which importantly has this angle factor. Um, I should have written it, but it's just 1 minus cosine. And then this is the exact spin-spin correlation function. So above the transition temperature, um, for the more experts in the room, this is a screened correlator. But below it, it's not screened. And so direct electrons, um, if we looked at just the single particle lifetime, it would actually blow up. Um, and we have another way of regularizing it. but. Um, the important thing is that the screening um, due to these gauge field fluctuations is very low in the Dirac system. So this is a pretty large effect. And you can see as momentum goes to zero, this is going to um, increase here. So from this formula, we can calculate uh, the resistivity that we find. And we can find the effect of this ra random magnetic field on electron transport. So this is the main result of the calculation. So we find that there is the, the first effect that we find is that there is a peak in the resistivity near the transition temperature of TBKT. So it's not a universal peak directly at the transition temperature. And it depends on your chemical potential. 
And then we find that the resistivity scales linearly with temperature in three different regimes. So there's the regime as temperature goes to zero, and then there's temperature approaching the transition from the bottom, and then approaching the transition from the other side from the high temperature limit. So it was an interesting feature that these scale linearly with temperature in all three regimes, but the slope is dependent on your chemical potential. Um, and one nice thing that comes out of this is that it's pretty easy to pick this out from a transport measurement. So if you have phonons or something else in your system, they're not going to have a linear and temperature dependence. Um, and so ideally you can pick out scattering due to this effect. Um, you can separate it from scattering due to other effects in your system since you're not going to be able to create a perfectly clean system. Um, and for the experimentalists in the room, so we calculated this. Um, for example, if you have a chemical potential of 50 MeV and your coupling is 10 MeV, which is lower than what's been measured with impurities, but it's approximately correct for a full slab of material. Resistivity of the uh, TI at the transition, so that would be right here, is about two kilo ohms. So it's a real number that, that one could measure. Um, and so you can see that this effect in addition is much more pronounced for lower chemical potential. Um, and essentially, the lower the chemical potential, the less efficiently the Dirac fermions can screen these fluctuations. And so 10 MeV is about where our perturbative theory starts to break down. So we had um, that requirement that chemical potential be uh, larger than the coupling here. Um, and so this is, uh, there's lots of theories about what might happen directly at the Dirac point, but um, you can't use this sort of perturbative calculation to study that. But either way, this is a, a fairly clear effect that you could see even at like pretty high chemical potential, like 200. Uh, MeV. What's the spin stiffness? Sorry? What's the spin stiffness here? Of the magnet? I do not know off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Bigger than these MeVs or something? Um, I, yeah, I think, I think so. The transition temperature is, for typical magnets, is like 2 Kelvin. Um, so I don't. So it could be complicated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, the transition temperature is directly related to the spin stiffness. Um, so it would be comparable, I suppose. I was just wondering if you have to worry about the back action on electrons affecting the magnetic order. And then uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's really unlikely that, so from my understanding, if you are looking at the effect of the Dirac fermions on the magnet, it pretty much just renormalizes the in-plane anisotropy. So you have slightly stronger in-plane anisotropy. So it's going to maybe affect your transition temperature slightly, but it won't prevent the transition from happening. Um, that's a good question, though. So in conclusion, um, I really just want to advertise these TI plus magnetic material heterostructures there. They could be very interesting for studying you know, theoretical models that have been around for a long time or for making real devices. Um, in particular, this property of spin momentum locking is what we really need to be able to do this physics. Um, and we have a simple mapping from the magnetic moments to the effective gauge field. Uh, and we were able to see clear signatures of the random magnetic field um, in transport, I mean, theoretically, but you could do it in transport for three different regimes. So almost near long range disorder as you approach zero temperature, quasi long range disorder, and then completely disordered. Um, and we were uh, surprised to see that it scales linearly with temperature um, within sort of this perturbative Fermi liquid theory. Um, and in particular, the range and strength of the disorder is tunable by temperature or doping of the material. So thanks for listening. This is the reference to the paper. I also wanted to advertise a related paper by, um, by my collaborators on Amperian pairing, which has to do with uh, superconductivity in TIs mediated with magnetic fluctuations. Um, and this work was done in collaboration with Dimitria Fimkin, who has since moved to UT Austin, and my advisor, Victor Golitsky. Thank you.